use it. Undoubtedly, one of them is strenuous physical activity. Being on a bucking bronco or a serious roller coaster is a strenuous thing. There's a complex relationship between physical activity and emotion and your receptivity to the experiences. And within HCI, there's a whole crowd of people who are now looking at exertion games, led by Floyd Muller in particular at RMIT in Australia, who are looking at this intense relationship between gaming, interactivity, and physical stress and exertion. So you know, designing in physical activity is definitely one tactic for introducing an element of discomfort, make people tired and exhausted. Physicality also applies to the interaction devices themselves. So the keyboards and the mice that we use these days are pretty anodyne bits of plastic and metal. And to my fingers, they don't feel very much at all. A gas mask is far from that. It's smelly, sweaty, hot, rubbery, clings to your skin. The example here is from a piece of work that appeared at Kai a few years ago called The Meat Book in which you interacted with raw meat in order to control digital media. In itself, a bizarre and frankly quite uncomfortable experience. Okay, why not go the whole hog? Why not hurt people? Now that is a shocking idea, but there are interfaces that also do it by literally shocking people. Not in a serious way, but this is a, uh, a small, electric shock reaction test game that I bought off the internet and I occasionally use with my students, particularly when they were not handing their work in on time. And it's a simple enough game. Everybody takes the contr a controller, four of you. You wait for the light to come on. When the light goes off, the last person to let go of the controller gets an electric shock. Anyone who lets go of it before the light goes off also gets an electric shock. It doesn't kill you, it doesn't seem to do you any permanent damage. But it does hurt, and it makes you a pretty uncomfortable, but on the whole, quite amusing game to play. There are other artworks in the literature that have done things like make users hold their hands against a heating up metal plate while they watch a story to the point where they feel they have to remove their hand and they can no longer follow the story. So there are examples out there doing this. Moving away from physicality, let's talk about control. Control is central to HCI. The craft of the, the interface designer is to get somebody to control the machine. And as I said in the introduction, we have a set of well-defined principles for how control should work. Ben Schneiderman says, quite rightly, the locus of control shall remain with the user. It's one of his golden rules. The user should be in control. So if you distort that relationship, you're going to make people feel uncomfortable. You're going to be breaking the way things usually work. So surrendering, giving up control to the machine is definitely part of the tactic that we're seeing the artists use. That's what Brendan's doing. That's what any ride designer is doing. A modern ride is, after all, a computer with an interface stuck on it. The interface is a track and a cart, but it's all computerized. And, uh, Essentially what you're doing is giving yourself up for three minutes to the complete and utter control of a computing system. Surrendering control to other people is also interesting. So last theory, take control of you in our from Amen. And they increasingly do it through the experience. And each time you say, I'm willing to go on a bit further, they get more and more demanding in how you have to comply with their instructions. In Breathless, Brendan gives over control to another user altogether. And then the final tactic is this reminder, I guess, of something I've already said. And that's this notion of battling your own body. Actually battling yourself for control. And I think this is particularly powerful because a number of the technologies we're bringing to HCI now, physiological monitoring, and now brain computer interfaces, which are commercially available, these are, at some level, inherently uncontrollable. You cannot control how you breathe. Your autonomic system will take over after a while. You cannot control what you think. Uh, you can control it for short periods of time. Speaking to you now, I'm controlling my breath in a, a 
very clear way that you can't keep it up forever. And so even your own body becomes the battleground with this kind of interaction. And that's an uncomfortable experience. <coughs> Strategy three. So computers aren't only about controlling stuff anymore. For the last few decades, they've also been about social relationships. Computers are now at the heart of how we interact with other people through email and social media and all of that good stuff. So if you mess around with that, then you could distort people's social relationships and again, make them feel uncomfortable. So here are some tactics. Intimacy with strangers. I'm not so sure about how a Korean audience feels about intimacy with strangers, but in Britain, it's not really the dumb thing, to be honest. Intimacy with your family is, on the whole, not really the dumb thing in Britain, but intimacy with strangers is definitely out of the question. So if you put people in a one-to-one -one with an actor in a room, they're pretty uncomfortable. Or if, like Floyd Muller and his team here, with that musical embrace, you put a device between two strangers' bodies and encourage them to hug each other in order to squeeze it and interact with music, then you set up a situation where people do feel profoundly uncomfortable. Hugging and squeezing a stranger is, a, for most people, a pretty bad experience. A weird form of intimacy is to have no, inter no intimacy whatsoever, to be isolated from people. And this is one of Blast Theory's favourite tactics. Whenever they do one of the locating works, you always end up in the city, on your own, lost, with nobody else around that you know. And that's a phenomenally powerful thing, to take away all the social comforts of someone who might be able to tell you what to do and leave you on your own with just the technology. Very powerful. And last of all, computers are good at surveillance. Remote video cameras, collecting people's data, all of this we know from the debates we're having about what happens to our data is part and parcel of what they do. And surveillance and voyeurism are tactics that we see running throughout all of the works that I presented. In our reclaimment, there's that sense of being watched all the time doing these weird gestures. There's not only discomfort in being watched, but potentially discomfort in watching other people. One of Brendan's subsequent experiences was to send parents into a horror maze filmed around the saw thing, while children, not young children, teenage children, watched on on a screen. And this was a pretty uncomfortable experience. Seeing your mother apparently scared in a horror maze is something that sets up a, a particular discomfort. So to watch other people, and then sometimes it's uncomfortable when somebody watches you watching things. If you're watching things that you're not really meant to watch, and somebody else is watching you, you don't want to give away how you're feeling about it, do you? And the last strategy. We shouldn't forget also the meaning that's inherent to play. It's not just about physical stuff, it's not just about control and social connections, there is meaning in these works. So the themes themselves, of course, are uncomfortable in some cases. Perhaps not Brendan's work, but Blast Theory certainly. And the devices, the choice of a gas mask also has important cultural meanings. My parents, uh, the children during the war, my mother tells me about carrying a gas mask to school, having to put it on and hide under the table. If I present her with a gas mask and ask her to put it on, it's going to have some pretty strong memories uh, for her and conjure those up instantly. Okay, enough. Enough with the tactics. I feel like a very bad person. I feel like there's a, a room full of people, hopefully, who aren't paying any attention, but maybe a few of them are writing this down, and maybe a few of the few are going to go and do something about it. And uh, we might all live to regret it. So let's end with a few words about being ethical before you say, Steve Benford told me to cause pain to you. It's not my fault. On the whole, the ultimate point of these experiences is not to make people uncomfortable. It is, remember, to entertain them, to enlighten them, 
to socially bond them. And if they don't do that, you're definitely in trouble. On the whole, most of these experiences don't leave people feeling uncomfortable at the end. That's not always true. Some artworks do. You leave the gallery still feeling uncomfortable, you think about it for a long time afterwards. But roller coasters don't work like that. It's a bad roller coaster where people come off feeling bad. Even the ride virgin was happy to be alive at the end of that piece of video, and it almost looked as if he'd do it again, although I wonder whether he would really. So you need to think of discomfort as a journey, and you need to design it as such. And to understand the journey, let's go back to a little bit of theatre, a little bit of performance theory, and Gustav Freitag, who proposed the pyramid model of performance. You may be sort of familiar with it. Basically says, drama and performance consists of several stages. There's exposition, setting the scene, introducing the characters, explaining what's going to happen. Rising action, a gradual, ramped up, slow, increasing dramatic tension and suspense. A climactic moment where everything unfolds. Falling action, as things begin to get resolved and play out. And a denouement, when things may or may not become clear, and you get to understand and reflect. So I think if you're designing the kinds of experiences I'm talking about, you need a picture like that in mind. Maybe it will have more peaks and troughs in it than just one, but those <coughs> principles apply. Notice the way I've drawn it. The falling action and the climax implicitly don't take perhaps quite as much time as the rising action. That I would suggest is a good strategy. You're better off to give people anticipation and a not so bad, shorter, just uncomfortable experience than to give them a very gentle ramp up and then make them feel terrible all of a sudden. And by way of proof, here is the Oblivion roller coaster, the world's first vertical drop roller coaster, and look at it. It is exactly a manifestation of Gustav Freitag's five act structure of drama, isn't it? You can perfectly map it onto the exposition, the rise of action, the climax literally the falling action and finally the doing the more. So I guess what I'm saying to you is design discomfort into a, into a journey. Resolve it and at the end of the day remember entertainment, enlightenment and sociality. Even then you may be entering a bit of a minefield. It's not as simple as that. There are lots of specific ethical dilemmas to deal with. And if you're a researcher working in this space, working with creative people and artists, you're going to have to confront those when dealing with your ethics committees and institutional review boards. So when we started this work with artists 20 years ago, we didn't have an ethics committee in computer science, we probably did it in a medical school somewhere, but not in CS, but we do now. And this work of this kind has to be run past them and justified, quite rightly too. But it's difficult. It's difficult for several reasons. Um, ethics committees and review boards, the ones in computer science and HCI, I think, certainly the ones I've, I know and have dealt with, their ethical process and model is grounded in an experimental one. It's grounded in experimental psychology, which is somehow grounded in medicine, and that has a set of concerns about doing an awful lot of work with participants on the way into an experience, quite rightly too, getting consent nailed down, written down, uh, absolutely agreed, legally watertight. Some of the things that artists do prove quite difficult to accommodate within that model. So firstly, artists are deliberately transgressive, deliberately so, not all of them, but a good many of them pick on issues that society finds difficult. It's not uncommon in the UK, I'm sure it is in Korea too, for arts, artworks to be banned, or if they're not banned, to cause outrage in the newspapers. 20 years later, they're often seen as great pieces of art, but at the time, they were exactly prodding an ethical or moral issue that society was struggling to deal with. So when you turn up to an ethics committee, one of these bits of work, 
not always, but sometimes you know that you're pushing a button. You know from the outset that you're deliberately provoking discussion around an issue. That can be quite hard. And artists tend to deal and cross people's personal boundaries too. They push people to the limits. Now they're good at doing this because they're good at judging those limits and they have on the whole a relationship of trust that these good artists do. And they can build up consent during a performance and work out the line and work out when to back off. But as a researcher, those things are not so clear. Consent and withdrawal are quite difficult to deal with. Uh, most of the artists we work with seriously don't like the idea of us as researchers giving people forms before a performance and asking them to fill them in and sign up their consent. That breaks the exposition of the artwork, the framing of it, in the first place. So that's a real challenge. One group of artists we work with made an alternate reality game based around a scientific conspiracy. And it became very clear that even if we asked the participants to sign an ethics form, they thought it was part of the game anyway. So it wasn't clear whether they were giving their consent or not. I do have a, an alternative suggestion, though, for how to deal with all the problems. I think with this kind of work, you need to pay more attention to ethics on the way out. So yes, you must do ethical process on the way in. Yes, you must think about consent and safety. I'm not saying you don't do anything. But unlike the sort of medical model where you sign everyone up, and then on the whole you don't go back to talk to them afterwards, with this kind of work, you should give the audiences a forum to shout at you. So there should be an ethical process, but often it's after the artwork where people try and make sense of it. If people are offended, let them shout, have a discussion. That's the point. So I would argue for ethical processes, but maybe rethinking around how they're done. Well, I look at the clock, and I notice it's running out. So um, I hope it has made you too uncomfortable watching the artworks. I hope you take something away from it, but perhaps not the bit about causing pain to people, at least not to me anyway, I'm not going for that. If you are interested in knowing more, then uh, please do buy the book, uh, but equally there's a couple of papers, one on discomfort and a more recent one on the ethics of HCI's turn to the cultural that you might like to take a look at. And thank you very much indeed for your invitation and your attention. Nice to apply to the game design to make game fun. 
then what would be the difference between the fun factor, fun design factor of the game and uncomfortableness of, or discomfortness of the interactions? Um, yes, I'm not. It would be well worth trying to unpack what is probably quite a complex relationship between fun and suspense and thrill and discomfort. And there has been work in HCI on fun. It's kind of a funology movement a few years ago and several papers written about fun. Um, to give you a bit of a layman's response, so now I have a, I, I'd be tempted to separate them. So I think you can make computer games that are fun, where you end up doing horrible things to people, you know, just shooting stuff uh, or whatever, uh, various other awful things you do in computer games, without really thinking about it, without feeling uncomfortable about it, um, maybe without feeling suspense if it's a, a shoot em up game. I guess there is suspense, you might be killed, but in the moment. So, you know, I think things can be fun and horrific in a game because perhaps the designers haven't done that with this company. I think more interesting is to perhaps in game design take the fun out of those actions but bring in the thrill and the suspense. So to make people, in some sense, live the more understandable and reflective way. Does that answer the question? Let's not this one. Um, so in your work, um, it, it, you know, it sounded by design you are uh, designing to be transgressive and boundary pushing. And in doing that, have you come up against any boundaries that you don't want to go beyond? And so I guess when, when I was listening to your talk, I was thinking, are there, um, are there good sorts of discomfort and bad sorts of discomfort and what sorts of insights have you gained? Um, so, in, in our works, we are not, traditionally, we didn't see ourselves as the designers. We made quite a strong separation between the artists uh, and our role as the technologists and people who studied and reflected on that. And that's not to absolve ourselves of any responsibility. We're still responsible for deciding who we want to work with. And there have been artists and people who come from us with proposals and things that for various reasons we didn't feel comfortable to do, feel unable to do. Um, uh, more lately, I guess it's got a, a bit more confused because there are now several artist researcher, possibly researcher artist characters in the group. So I guess those boundaries between creation, um, uh, yeah, creation research have become much more kind of blurred. Um, whether whether I can kind of answer the question now in principle, like, are there any kinds of discomfort that I wouldn't do? I don't know. I mean, I have my own moral compass. There are some topics I don't want to engage with, some topics I think are not appropriate, some things that I believe are uh, too obscene to put in front of people, some things that I know that are legally obscene or inappropriate that I would not engage with. So I wouldn't do things that are illegal, um, uh, unless as a personal protest, I was prepared to go down there, which I'm not. I don't know if that answers the question, but yes, there are, there are limits, and it is an ethical and moral judgment about the kind of work you've done. A quick follow-up, I guess, are there some experiences of discomfort that don't work, like that, that don't serve the purpose that you're aiming to accomplish, in terms of sociality or um, enlightenment or entertainment? I think we've certainly made our We've made interactive pieces that some of which don't work, and some work less well than others, and some of that because they're not so well thought through, and some of that may be about the ways in which they do it. Um, and we have had examples of experiences where people have been really upset by things and left and wanted their money back um, and wanted to shout at the artists afterwards, uh, yes. Uh, yeah, but whether, yeah, then there's a reflection in the team on whether that is a bad artwork or whether that's uh, to someone who didn't get it. I'm not answering your question in any specific way, I'm saying. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious, you know, 